Thanks, Karen, and welcome everyone back to Data Collab Lab. It's been a while, but we had a little intermission for Data AI Summit. So if you didn't check that out, go, go check out the amazing announcements that came out of it. My name is Lee Blackwell. I'm a solution architect and i um, joined here by my Brady bunch of a family, as you can see. <laughs> go ahead, Spencer. Yeah, thanks, Lee. I'm Spencer Cook. I'm also a solutions architect at Databricks. Excited to be here for my first uh, Collab Lab. Franco? Thanks, uh, Spencer and Lee. Uh, my name is Franco Patano. I'm also a solutions architect here with Databricks. Um, and I am excited to introduce today two of our uh, colleagues that work in the field as well to present their uh, uh, great project. But also, I want to introduce Prasad, uh, who is a part of our partner team. Prasad, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Prasad Kona. I'm a solutions architect, part of the uh, product partnerships team. Uh, I'm pretty excited to be out here. Yeah, uh, I wanted to introduce uh, Ricardo. Great, thanks Prasad. My name is Ricardo. I'm a solutions architect at Databricks, specializing in financial services. Um, so great to be here uh, to talk about our project. Samir, do you want to introduce? Yeah, sure. Hello everyone, Samir Redzapadzic. Um, I'm a senior customer success engineer here at Databricks, uh, mainly specializing in financial services. Um, really grown a passion over, over my career of helping clients kind of strategically operationalize their analytics to across the data lifecycle, um, use their analytics to better their overall strategies. And the topic we have today is something that I've really grown a passion in um, probably over the last four to five years of understanding how to use alternative data and third-party data sources um, and integrating them into my client's business strategies to drive value and drive growth. So today, Ricardo and I are gonna be going through one of the many capabilities that can address this and how Databricks can enable this to be done at ease. Um, that capability is, is the concept of customer engagement. And thank you, Ricardo, for pulling that up. Um, yeah, so customer engagement, it's, it's the concept of how an individual interacts with an offering such as a product service or a specific brand. And traditionally how financial institutions have um, dealt with customer engagement and more specifically marketing functions is that they've defined customer engagement just based on the recency, frequency, monetary, also known as RFM, attributes of a customer. The thing is there, there are a lot more um, behavioral attributes and data that we have um, that can really differentiate the customers in the population. For example, if a customer is an online shopper or not, um, if they have a registered account with, with the brand, the card, the product or not, um, the kinds of SKUs that they shop at and how much they spend at these different SKUs, as well as some even more powerful ones that you might not even have in-house. And that's, that's where these third-party data sources come into play. And we'll go through some of them today and how they can really drive some value um, and provide a lot of insight downstream. So continuing on, scrolling down. Um, so the concept that we're creating today is this, is this creation of a customer engagement indicator. Um, and this is an indicator that can be used downstream in different strategies um, across different functions within the business. Um, and we've really broken it down into an eight step process from ingestion to execution. Um, the first being ingesting the, the data into a centralized location, profiling that data to get an understanding of what, what you're working with there, then transforming that data um, and engineering it into features that can be used within a machine learning algorithm, which we'll go over. Um, normalizing that data so that there's added value downstream as you're applying those. Uh, machine learning algorithms, executing that machine learning algorithm, in this case, an unsupervised approach, um, and then performing some descriptive analytics. And we'll get into this deeper in the call, um, but this is where the, the real business value and the insight comes in of what do you do with your machine learning algorithm? From there, um, we, we define some engagement thresholds, which again, we'll go into detail of, um, summarizing those engagement levels and then applying them down to the business. So that's the whole high level overview. And one thing I wanna note, feel free to add questions in the chat as we're going through. Um, Franco, we'll, we'll pull them up, stop me. Um, we can address them from the technical side or the business side. So continuing on. Um, you know, what, are, if, what, are uh, some, uh, what are some like ways that you can get business value out of this type of model? Like real quick, like what are some quick wins that actually you can apply these things to? Cause you said business value. 
Can you just give us some quick examples of, of like applications? Yeah, from that standpoint, we'll go into detail towards the end, but at a high level, for example, from the marketing standpoint, um, better, better um, marketing to your customers and applying the budget that you have to your optimal customers. So if you know that a customer has a high level of spend of, in automotive, for example, um, and they're a highly engaged customer with that specific product, they have a higher likelihood that they're going to respond to an automotive upsell or automotive offer, as opposed to someone that might have limited spend. Um, and that's where this concept of customer engagement um, will enable you to understand how your customer differentiates within the population. Awesome. So continuing on, um, what we've got here is, is a high level uh, architecture um, of, of what this capability is. Um, and it's broken out into four different categories of being our different data sources, the data ingestion process, the data enrichment and consolidation process, and then the end result of data science, which after that can be followed up with business application. So touching on the, on the left side there, the data sources, we've, we've got a number of different data sources, one being your, your customer um, relationship manager um, from the standpoint of understanding the existing data that you have on your customers, the product and transactional level data on your customers. And then this is where the, the interesting aspect and the concept of data sharing and delta sharing, a new capability of Databricks comes into play. And that's pulling in these third-party data sources of, of attributes that you might not have. Um, so traditionally, a lot of financial institutions are already pulling in credit bureau data, um, but the way they're pulling in, it might not be in, a, in an automated fashion might, might be a lag in production. Um, and having this capability of ingesting it in real time really can add value down the line. And continuing down with that, um, also having alternative credit data, alternative marketing data, um, as well as different other third parties that you might deal with on, on a day-to-day -day basis, for example, retailers that you might partner with. And the last one I wanna, I wanna really stress here is, is the concept of entity resolution. A lot of these strategies, that the only way that you'll really drive value um, and drive large value to the business is, is by understanding who your customer is. Um, and by pulling in additional attributes, such as something from LexisNexis, an identifier like that, um, and resolving your customer and, and really increasing your energy resolution percentage that's where you can get instrumental and exponential growth um, across these strategies. So next, Ricardo is gonna to touch on kind of the data ingestion process and the transformation and how that really can be automated um, and done it with ease when it comes to Databricks and some of our partners. Perfect, thanks, Samir. Um, yeah, so one of the things that we wanted to highlight in addition to all these kind of um, wide variety of data sources was a couple of ways that you can actually get it into Delta Lake. Uh, we're, we're kind of presenting here the, the lake house architecture where you can uh, define a data model, you can um, process your data, do batch ETL streaming, and then ultimately uh, use machine learning to get some of the insights that Samir is gonna show. But we didn't wanna minimize the ingestion process. And we wanted to talk about two partners specifically that, are, uh, that we work very well together with. So those two tools are Fivetran and DBT. So um, you can kind of see here that Fivetran is really the data ingestion mechanism to pull in things like account level information. So if you're trying to ingest, for example, Salesforce data or Marketo data or any, basically any database um, in particular, then uh, you know, Fivetran has hundreds of different uh, connectors and data sources that you can kind of incrementally pull data from. And so we're going to highlight that for a database today, um, but they do work with, uh, like I said, hundreds of connectors, and it makes it really easy to take that data and then incrementally land it into Delta Lake, into a table that you can ac access in Databricks. So um, I'll show a little bit about how that works. And uh, the other uh, tool that we want to highlight today is DBT. So I think a lot of, especially in financial services, a lot of our customers that we see uh, when they're trying to do some simple uh, feature engineering and analysts and data scientists want direct access to the data so they can actually uh, apply business logic, DBT is a great orchestration and um, SQL orchestration framework um, and tool to basically write your, um, write your data models, write your SQL scripts to process the data. So 
uh, we are going to show a sample DBT project, and you can actually execute this DBT project directly from Fivetrain as well, which is really exciting. So, um, a quick question there. Absolutely. Um, you know, I don't, I don't interact in a bunch with Fivetrain and DBT and some of my customers, and so I'm curious. Both of you guys are really um, in the financial services space, and maybe this is more for Prasad. Like, what other verticals do we see these partners really, um, you know, playing in as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when when we're looking at these uh, in-just use cases, it's it's just not on the you know not just on the financial side, but we see across all all, all verticals, uh, right? I mean, here you're seeing some of the examples of uh, uh, the data sources uh, that one could ingest, right? Depending on where uh, on a vertical, I mean, if you're looking at various customers, you see things uh, uh, like uh, Salesforce, Marketo, Google Ads, all, all of these being um, a common data sources that people want to do analytics on, right? And so uh, this is where uh, uh, um, ingestion tools like uh, Fivetran help get data from these various sources ingested into Delta so that you could uh, do your analytics. Awesome, thank you. Great question, Lee. So- yeah, I love the use of third parties there. Yeah, and the, the, the value here is, you know, our customers want a really quick and easy way to ingest things like Salesforce data. Uh, if you had to write your own connector for that, that would just take away time from, you know, data teams to be able to actually work on business logic and domain specific problems. So that's kind of why we're highlighting it here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with DBT specifically, uh, DBT is, uh, like I said, it's a great, um, framework that allows different uh, personas, analysts, and data scientists and engineers to uh, write SQL and then introduce some governance over the, those SQL scripts and those data models. So I have this kind of just one pager that shows you kind of where DBT sits. Um, it's basically, um, like I said, it's a framework. You can templatize queries. You can execute them incrementally. Um, and you can do all of these things. So you can transform data. Uh, with SQL, you can add tests to uh, your SQL scripts as well. If you want to test for uniqueness or test for, um, you know, non-null conditions and put that into the same uh, Git repository with all of your other SQL scripts, then a DBT run will actually execute all those tests. Um, so the quality is built in. But um, DBT also has a cloud-specific um, um, SaaS product with, you know, um, alerting, job runs, logging, uh, and various things, which is called uh, DBT Cloud. So this is kind of a little bit about DBT. And just to, to give a quick flavor, I'm not going to go too deep into these, but um, this is the Fivetran um, dashboard UI. So basically what we did here for this uh, financial services use case was we had two, diff two different types of data. We had transaction data. So think of your first party data. And then we have um, what we call just third-party behavioral attributes. So what, what was the automotive spending? What was online spending? So um, we kind of have those two different data sources in uh, Postgres in a database. So you saw here that I have a Postgres connector set up. And what Fivetrain is doing essentially is just reading uh, from that database and then incrementally landing the records in a Delta table. So really easy way to just get up and running in an automated fashion. You can see here, whenever I have a specific sync, so one ran this morning, it'll give you a little bit of the audit information. Typically it'll give you uh, data size information as well. So all that's kind of easy to set up. All you have to do to use Databricks is set up connection information, point it to a, a specific cluster that you want to use as the backend compute. So that sync is running. Um, it's landing all your data into a couple of Delta tables, which uh, we'll show and do some exploratory work on. But I just wanted to mention the DBT integration as well. So there's this transformations. And uh, basically what you can do here is you just configure a Git repository. So you point Fivetran to whatever GitHub uh, or Git repository you have with all your DBT code. And it will execute all of that, for the DBT run for you. So here's a, an example of a successful run uh, pointing to that repository, it's waking up um, the cluster that it's going to use, executed all of the different models that I have in DBT. So these are all the SQL scripts that are running. 
um, executing any tests should they exist, and then giving me you know pass or fail. So again, it's it's a great way to actually do all of this from the same environment. And we actually set up all of our SQL scripts and code in Databricks itself. So once we get to that feature engineering, we'll give an idea of, of how to set that up and how easy it is from Databricks as well. So okay. if I understand that, that correctly, uh, essentially, if, you, if, you're, if your organization needs a low code or no code way to ingest and transform data with primarily SQL, you can essentially with Fivetran and DBT, enable that type of architecture on Databricks, you don't need to code everything. Is that right? Yeah, for the five train ingestion, that's true. For kind of for the DBT, it's not necessarily like a GUI interface. You'll still need to write the SQL code to do some of the transformation. But as far as orchestration and setting up jobs, you can do that with no code, as I kind of showed before, just in terms of scheduling orchestration. That's awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, great. So like I said, we're, DBT is primarily used in this context for some of the feature engineering on the, our transaction level data, our behavioral attributes, um, and just kind of creating some of those RFM um, attributes that Samir was mentioning. So once we get there, we'll, we'll show a little bit of um, what the code looks like. But essentially, those are the frameworks which you know, are extremely good to leverage and, uh, and speed up your time to value. So Samir, um, feel free to, to take it from here and and talk yeah. about our project. So that was a little bit about kind of how do we can automate this entire process. Um, what, what we're going to talk about now is really diving into the development. How, to, how do we create this concept of a customer engagement indicator? Um, and, and the first thing we did is we, we mocked up some data, Ricardo and I, um, to simulate what, what, what this could look like um, for one of our clients. Um, and the two data sets we're using here is one being in, in, in a bank's transactional data of um, customer transactions by transaction date, um, transaction amount, and, and a specific merchant. Um, and then the second data set we're using is what we're considering a third party data set. Um, this is auto spend that could be coming from a specific retail partner, um, as well as online spend. Um, it could be that the bank doesn't know when, when transactions are being performed online versus um, in store at a retailer. Um, so those are the two specific ones. Um, the next step in the process from there, once this data has been ingested, is really profiling the data. And, and we're not going to spend too much time here, but one thing I do want to stress here, which you can see, is that we're running SQL commands within a Databricks notebook. Um, for the individuals that are not familiar, that familiar with Databricks notebooks, um, with simple commands and, and differentiation in your code, you can run both um, SQL, Python, uh, Scala, you can perform R operations as well. Um, and, and just going, yeah, there you go. Um, just going through this, you can even see um, in our profiling process, we've got tables outputted. Um, as we scroll through, you'll see um, that we're able to quickly chart these as well um, from the profiling standpoint, if there's specific points that we want to see. Um, look at our data in a certain way. Um, we can do bar charts, we can do um, pie charts, we can do scatter plots, all in one environment. Um, so no longer do you need to export your data um, into a visualization tool just to do some basic profiling of your data. Every, all of your SQL analysis can be done here and then charted very easily. So if we keep going through, we can skip through the profiling. Um, also, something to note in the essence of collab, collab lab, um, the you know the little color boxes at the top indicating that there's three users in this notebook right now. So Databricks offers a collaborative notebook environment. Yeah, exactly. Thank, thank you, Lee. So, like from that standpoint, if if Ricardo wants to profile a certain set of customers in a certain way, I can work in the same environment using the same data, um, running scripts on the potentially the same customers. Um, to do my own sort of profiling. So moving forward with the customer engagement um, life cycle and process, the next step is really um, feature engineering, developing the attributes that we're gonna be using in our models. Um, and here, uh, what Ricardo did is he already automated the process, um, but this same code could just run in a Databricks notebook um, as is. And what we're really doing here is we're 
we're calculating our concepts of recency, frequency, monetary, auto spend, and online spend for each of our customers. And the way we're doing that um, for recency, we're taking the max value of um, the transaction date for each customer. Um, or sorry, we're taking the max value of transaction date for our customer population and comparing that to the max value of transaction date for each of our customers, which in turn would give us um, what the customer's recency of transaction is. Um, similarly, we're calculating the frequency of transactions of each of our customers in this one year time period of our data. We're calculating the total monetary value of um, the transactions of these customers. And then we're joining in our automotive spend and our online spend so that we can look at that all in one place when we're doing our modeling. Yeah, and just to, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Spencer. Oh, no, I was just saying that's great. I think that's a really good example of some basic feature engineering that's really going to help your model train. Awesome. Um, yeah, and just a, a remark here as well. We talked about DBT and, and Git and all these uh, different tools. So to kind of connect those dots, this is the business logic that, you know, uh, Samir was talking about for RFM. Uh, which is a really simple way to kind of uh, just create some valuable features from transactional data. To connect this back to DBT and executing this uh, via DB DBT may not be obvious, but Databricks actually has this repos integration, which you can just sync up a, a Git repository directly to your Databricks workspace. So we've actually done that. Um, if I click on this repos feature, then uh, we have this basically project that we uh, clone from this DBT FS personalization Git, which is right here. So this is a private repository. Uh, we configured everything to uh, basically Git clone that. Uh, you can do it pretty easily from, from here, from the UI. And what you're seeing are the SQL scripts inside of the models folder. So under models, which should be familiar if you use DBT, uh, you can put any number of uh, SQL scripts here um, so that your models execute once you call DBT run. So that's kind of the integration point. Anytime I wanna develop code here, I can execute against real data and then push this back to Git. And those five tran DBT transformation runs that are scheduled every day um, in this project will execute. So really simple way to automate your data, uh, sorry, automate your SQL scripts, um, add that level of testing and governance uh, to those processes since those are typically kind of hard to set up. So just wanted to cover that. Back to you, Samir. Yep. Yeah, so if we continue on, now we've got, we've got all our features designed, um, all of our data is in one place, one table. Um, the next step we wanna do is normalize our data so that's friendly from the standpoint of using it in our, um, in our models. So our recency ranges from one to 150 while our monetary is ranging from cents all the way up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we wanna normalize our data so that each attribute can have equal weighting um, when it comes to our, our um, machine learning approach. And the way we do that is we take whatever the, the value is for that customer and we divide it by the max value of that specific column. Um, and there's a lot of approaches to, to normalize this data or standardize this data. Um, this was the basic approach we, we took specifically um, as it relates to, to having something that we can demo for all of you. Something that I want to kind of connect the dots here, Ricardo brought up a, gate, a great point, but I kind of want to just, he's going through here showing executing SQL. And one of the things, like as someone who's tried to use different SQL tools out there, like the thing that DBT offers that is great is the, the version control, tracking everything, um, the, the, B, the Jinja, right? The dynamic SQL is a huge thing. The thing that DBT doesn't have is an execution execution engine. So you can't like execute your queries, look at the data and develop your code at the same time. You'll have to go to an execution engine. Uh, you know, there are other popular vendors out there, but you can use Databricks SQL. And in the word notebook environment, you can be executing the SQL, understanding the data, and then you can be writing the DBT code, the DBT SQL code, right inside of the same notebook, and then check it in and have it run on Fivetran. So I just want to connect all those dots because that is extremely powerful, right? It, do you do that type of development when you're working with these tools? Is that common or am I off base here? 
Um, yeah, I, the, absolutely. Like the workflow that you mentioned, Franco is um, the is a huge amount of value, right? So you're doing it's your so you know kind of an integration test on live data, and then immediately automate it. Um, that's not really uh, yeah easy to do typically. So I think the the partnership there is is major. Going back to Wee's point about collaboration within notebooks, mm -hmm. once you get up to a certain amount of scale, and let's say you have multiple people working on multiple scripts, how do you plan on handling gating those check-ins, right? And do you use any type of branching or uh, pull requests? Yeah, that's a good question. For the purposes of this demo, um, we actually didn't, we, we just checked in everything into a main branch because it was actually just, uh, I think, just a couple of folks. But all yeah. that, all the typical uh, branching is available here. So if you wanted to create a branch, um, develop or something else, uh, like a feature branch or release branch, you can go ahead and do that and and uh, and branch off just using the the native Git integration. Makes sense. Thanks. Sure. So continuing on, um, now that we have our, all of our features in, in a single place, normalized um, in a friendly way to, to perform a modeling approach, we'll start with the actual unsupervised um, machine learning algorithm. Um, and the one, the one we chose to do here is k-means clustering, um, a friendly, very common approach in the market in the industry. Um, but before we dive into the actual uh, clustering algorithm, what we want to do first is understand, OK, we've got our data. Is our data appropriate to cluster on? Um, and what we want to do is visualize that data using an approach called TSNE. Um, and what that does is it, it reduces our data into groups of similar values, um, which can then be represented across two or three axes. Um, and then while these this isn't exactly clustering, it allows us to, to understand based off a of visual um, if our data is naturally separating. And if we look at the charts here, um, and three of our variables, um, we can see some natural separation where we, where we know that downstream when we do perform our algorithm, there can be lines that are drawn that would make sense. So continuing down, now that we know that um, clustering is appropriate for, for this specific data set, um, as it relates to a clustering approach, we need to understand what is the optimal number of clusters um, that we can use in our, in our uh, machine learning algorithm. And in this scenario, what we wanted to do is demo two different um, approaches, the silhouette method, as well as the elbow method. Um, and without spending too much time on these, um, just because we can spend the entire hour just talking about clustering, um, we, we chosen a K or the number of clusters to be, to be 12. Um, again, this is, this is a concept of just optimal number of clusters. You, you, you can't really go wrong. The more you choose, the more um, interesting your results could be, especially as it relates to what this approach is. Um, so what we do now is we train our model using our five attributes. You just scroll up a little bit, Ricardo. Um, we train our model using our five attributes of recency, frequency, monetary, and then our, our uh, third party attributes of automotive spend and online dollar spend. Um, and we train it across hoping to get 12 clusters in our output. From there, we can predict what cluster each of our customers um, fall into um, and assign clusters to each of them. And what I've seen very commonly in industry, um, some separation that happens when it comes to unsupervised machine learning is that people get very excited with the concept of clustering, but then you get your end result and every customer has a cluster, but the business side of it doesn't understand, okay, what do I do with this? What does this mean to me? Um, which is where we took this approach to um, create a concept of an engagement score based off the attributes that we're seeing here and the cluster distribution that we have. And this, this concept of engagement score is really modeled, and no pun intended there, um, off of a risk-based approach. So the way risk scores are created in something like anti-money laundering or any other risk-based approach to scoring. Um, and that's creating a single score for each attribute that you're using. Um, and then the consolidation of the different attribute scores gives you your overall um, score for that population or for that customer. So what we did here, if we scroll down a little bit, Ricardo, is we performed 
Um, yep, keep going down. We, we assign these different scores um, to the different cluster groups. And the way we did that is we calculated averages of each um, value that we used in our clustering approach. Um, so for example, cluster eight had an average recency of three, average monetary of 241,000, an average frequency of 960, or sorry, 956. Um, and using those average values, we divided those by the 99th percentile of that specific, um, that specific attribute as it relates to the entire customer population. And what we got there was a specific score for each attribute for each cluster. So if we look at um, average frequency, for example, the 956 average frequency of that first row for that cluster um, provided a, a frequency score of 1.4, meaning that most likely the 99th percentile was around 600, 650, um, giving it that score. The consolidation of all of the scores of these attributes is then what gives us our engagement score. And by rank ordering those, then we're able to rank order our, our cluster population to understand, okay, what does the overall engagement look like for, for each of these cluster segments? Um, as well as if you look to the right, we've got a distribution of what, how many customers fit into these populations. Um, what we're able to do from there is then further separate these clusters um, into these buckets of engagement levels. So if you just scroll down a little bit, um, Ricardo, um, you can see here that we separated these clusters into four, four groups. And again, this, this is where some of the business input comes in and understanding of what your use cases are and what you're trying to do. Here we separated into four buckets of extreme, high, medium, and low, because that's what seemed to make sense as it relates to this data. We can see that, that the first top three clusters of eight, five, and zero, um, clearly separate themselves as it relates to all of the attributes we're seeing across. Um, and the engagement score reflects that. So this population of, I think it's about 30 customers um, are individuals that are very high spenders. They frequently spend, and we know they recently have spent. Um, but what's even more interesting is if you look at um, their third party data attributes, those provide some interesting feedback as well. Um, that one cluster, cluster eight, um, the majority of their spend, about 80%, is online spend. So the way you market to these customers would be very different than how you would market to someone that didn't spend online. The things that you would offer them, the um, upgrades that you might offer based off of specific products might be different. Um, and that's where kind of the next steps come in. So what we did from there once we had these different engagement levels is we summarized them into these buckets. So um, now what we have rather than our 100,000 customer population, rather than this 12 um, bucket population of clusters that really didn't mean that much to an end business user, we've got engagement levels now of extreme high, medium, and low. Um, and these rank order, and we've got different levels of, of population in each of these buckets that can then be used to differentiate your strategies. And that's, that's that next step that we want to talk about is, okay, now we've got the, the analytic, what do we do with it? Um, we've been talking about this concept of engagement. What's the value? Um, and if we keep scrolling down, we've, we've got some examples here of um, potential next steps that we could do as it relates to this data, how we can back test it in existing strategies that are currently happening within the institution. Um, and one thing I want to stress is an indicator like this doesn't just provide impact in, in an area of marketing um, when it comes to mailers or upsells. It can provide impact in other parts of the business that maybe traditionally didn't look at a concept of engagement. For example, credit, a very risk-based approach. Why wouldn't you want to understand how engaged a customer is with a potential brand or a specific product before um, increasing their line or even assigning them a line? Being able to partner with some of your third-party retailers and understanding, okay, what is this customer actually spending? How often are they spending? Will only allow you to optimize your line as a result, increasing your potential downstream revenue, um, reducing your overall risk and exposure, um, reducing your cost. Um, and at the end of the day, when you look at all of these aspects and all these different categories, for example, operations, call center, if a customer is highly engaged, 
why wouldn't you want to bring them to the front of the line so that they can get on and off the call a lot quicker? Increase that customer satisfaction. Um, what's that going to do? It's going to in turn provide great feedback for you as a business, provide great feedback for your potential retailers, wherever that spend is, and hopefully increase sales. And at the end of the day, increase your bottom line. Um, one thing I do want to stress here is we are not saying that engagement, this concept of engagement or engagement indicators, the one all be all when it comes to um, functional strategies. Um, a key thing that Ricardo and I are actually hoping to work on as the next step here is creating this concept of a, a signal library. Um, and this signal library is something that would be um, a library for all of your analysts, all your um, strategy individuals that can reference your engagement indicators, can reference your uh, marketing indicators, can reference your fraud indicators, your risk indicators, and using a consolidation of those attributes, be able to differentiate your customers and really see where the value is in potential strategies based off this back testing. Identifying those single, se single segments could be what will drive the exponential value for that specific business function um, down the line and really differentiate the business and differentiate the business to the customer. This is great. So you're saying that for the same budget that, that a business could be spending today, if they implemented something like this, they could essentially spend the same amount, but yield better. Now, when, when I was, I dabbled in this back in the day a little bit, conversion rates are what you're trying to, to, to change. You're trying to increase. When I was doing this, and this was a long, long, long time ago before I even think Spark was around, but like we tried doing different type of modeling techniques to increase the conversion rate. So what you're saying by implementing these types of, of algorithms on top of the data, which can be automated with our amazing tooling from our partners on top of Databricks to enable a low, lower code, SQL primarily coding, which is a generally more a prevalent language out in the market. You can, with the same budget you're spending today, essentially increase the return on your investments to optimize where you're spending that money to increase the yield. So you can increase your conversion rate by implementing these. So my real question is, how much would someone have to invest in this process using this tooling, just as an example, ballpark figure, what is the investment in time and money to adopt something like this, given I'm pretty sure this might be a solution accelerator, right? That's where we're slowly progressing it to is the, is the concept of solution accelerator. But for example, th this, this capability that we created here, it was, it was done within within a week, um, the end to end of having the data wow. to transforming it, training the models, drawing the line. Yes, when it comes to um, a larger financial institution, there are a lot more stakeholders that might want to have input into where these segments are, are separated. Um, but again, the value isn't here of this single engagement index um, or indicator. If we scroll up uh, real quick, Ricardo, and we look at even the cluster separation, um, there's interesting insights even in there. Um, and just having that in your, in your toolkit of signal libraries, um, if we look at that, that yellow middle bucket of clusters nine, four, and six, if, if you were to do some sort of online campaign where you want to increase spending of your online shoppers, or you want customers who shop online to shop more, um, traditionally, you might market to nine, four, and six. But if we look at our categories and our separation here, we know that uh, cluster six is a limited spender when it comes to online spending. So why wouldn't you focus the majority of your marketing dollars on, on the individuals that you know already spend, bring that to them to that second bucket potentially of being high spender and then differentiating them downstream in other strategies. So then not only do you have your marketing folks working on their strategies, but the way they work with customers interacts maybe with your risk folks or your collections folks. Um, and it really ends up being one integrated business of analytics. Cool. Yeah, and, and um, thanks for that, the, the really detailed summary, Samir. One thing I also want to call out to uh, Franco to your question, I think, um, you know, what we've done really well as a company is lower the barrier to entry if you're trying to stand up a project like this. So if you know how to code in SQL, you can apply this strategy and do all this feature engineering and use Databricks really easily out of the box. If you even want to uh, basically create a machine learning model for propensity to buy or something similar, 
uh, you can now use a glass box um, auto ML, right? So uh, we announced this at Data and AI Summit, but now if you actually want to just test out a model, come up with a baseline, and you've done some simple SQL feature engineering, something like RFM, for example, you can um, easily just set up a model, point it to your data that you have in your lake and get started. So uh, I consider the barrier to entry very low at this point. Um, so pretty easy to get started. And as Samir said, you know, we did this pretty quickly. Um, and these other tools that we had to ingest definitely simplified that and made it easier. You know, since you're on the architecture slide, I wanted to point out something to Ricardo. You know, sure. none of this is dependent on a particular cloud. You know, DBT and Fivetran, just like Databricks, support all three major clouds. And so this is something that a customer can pick up, you know, where they are and deploy it in their environment without needing to retool anything. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Quick question, you know, you guys have shown us you know, the unsup unsupervised learning methods, but I'm, my mind's going to maybe more supervised learning methods where let's say, you know, you get the data that a user wants to opt out of mailers. You know, do you guys see that out in the field where you can also apply those sorts of methods to this type of modeling? Yeah, I would say from that standpoint, that specific example would probably be something more so, um, that can be used by the business individuals while they're developing their strategy. But yeah, from the standpoint of once you have this kind of indicator, um, there's nothing holding you back from using it in supervised machine learning algorithms and even using it as a feature um, to develop new models. Um, to, and that's that concept of the signal library again that we were referencing is not only having something like the feature store, which Databricks recently released or um, announced, um, but having your end result of models be features in your future models um, and really just driving insight down the business with all the capabilities you, you have at, at your fingertips. That's awesome. Yeah, it's very um, open to, um, you know, ability to play around with all of this stuff. I saw a couple of snippets um referencing ML flow and some of your training code. Could you talk more broadly about how you used ML flow um, to leverage this solution? Yeah, yeah, I can speak to that. I think this notebook incorporates so many different tools <laughs> pretty right. Uh, seamlessly. So let's, uh, I can just speak to that a little bit. It wasn't a major part um, that we necessarily highlighted today, but yes, um, when we, when Samir had his uh, K-means model and we trained it, um, he actually wrapped it in this train model method. Um, and what I think is really, so MLflow is, as I think a lot of um, our viewers probably know, it's an open source toolkit for simplifying machine learning, uh, model lifecycle management, um, parameter tracking, deployment, model registry, et cetera. It's, a, it's extremely, an extremely popular open source project, um, but we integrate specifically with MLflow um, very well in the UI. So for example, when we did this training, we, um, you can see here that we use MLflow to log this model for mm -hmm. every K value. So um, it automatically just set up an experiment for us. Here are the different parameters that we, uh, we recorded. This is incredibly useful, even for unsupervised learning, right? When you wanna go back and look at audit information. So which K produced which silhouette score? Um, and then- So you didn't just well. wake up one day and decide 12 was the number. That's what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. Never, never with, uh, with K means. So I think Samir kind of spoke to that, but there's different techniques to, depending on whether you're looking at silhouette or the elbow method on how to choose these different K values, but MLflow really helps in kind of looking back and figuring out what did each experiment yield? Um, what was the best value, et cetera. Well, and I assume that especially with uh, finance applications, it's really important to have that lineage for your model. You know, people want to understand where things come from and be able to reproduce it. Yeah, absolutely. Re reproducibility is uh, extremely key. So uh, really easy to, to integrate. We, like I said, um, we already had this train model function. MLflow just allowed us to kind of record what we were doing along the way. So 
Senator, did you have any, any other comments to um, just on reproducibility or anything like that? From Yeah, I think one thing I just wanted to make sure I touched on is the concept of tracking. Um, another capability um, that we don't have integrated in this notebook is, is once you have this concept of customer engagement indicator um, integrated into your flow, um, if you were to input that into a Delta table that were to change over time, one interesting analysis that you can do is time travel as it relates to Delta. Um, and what you can see there is how an individual's uh, engagement has changed over time. And you can define those, those periods um, with different events from a business standpoint. And then you can forecast going forward. And this is where um, Lee, as you were talking about some of the more predictive aspects, before an individual's engagement actually does change, you can know it's gonna happen um, based on some certain event that you had identified um, and, and impact that event to be potentially exponential depending on what it is. So that, that's definitely another feature I, I wanted, to, wanted to talk about. That's awesome. Yeah, it all ties together really well. Yep. And just to, I'm just pulling this up as Samir was kind of talking about time travel. I mean, in general, all of these different Fivetran uh, or tables that were synced to Delta Lake from Fivetran, you, you'll have this level of audit information. So if you want to look at a different version as of a particular time, uh, this time travel feature is incredibly useful. Um, it'll give you lots of, if you actually created a notebook, which made a uh, change to a Delta table, you'll have that tracking and can go back to that notebook. You'll understand, you know, when you optimize data, when you updated it, merged it. So here you're kind of seeing some incremental merges, in fact, from uh, from Fivetran. So really useful. And you can you can also see which particular run of a, a model train, like which version of a Delta table it ran against. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if you wanted to reproduce a run, uh, you can go back to version three if that was when your model training was from, uh, and re reproduce that way. But yeah, I love Samir's uh, kind of input on basically taking a, a view of the, the summary engagement summary and then tracking that over time. So looking at it as a time series would be incredibly valuable as well. Yeah, I'd I love to see I, that. I didn't realize Fivetrain did merge. That's awesome. Is that just baked into the tool? Yeah, Prasad, do you want to uh, uh, And so, yeah, yeah uh, Fivetrain five will help you uh, ingest data from any source, right? And it handles uh, uh, both both uh, new incoming data and uh, and changes. And so it, uh, you can do uh, CDC from various sources depending on what source it is. Uh, for example, uh, it also supports uh, uh, CDC from uh, uh, certain uh, certain databases uh, also, right? It's it's not it's it's not just uh, um, cloud application sources, but uh, they, they do have 100 plus um, uh, various resources from which you can ingest data and they automatically handle uh, the, the change data uh, during ingest. That's amazing. I didn't realize they had that. So you're saying if you have like massive amounts of ETL from on-prem databases where you need to do CDC and merge them into your data lake, you can use something like a five train and it will do that pretty efficiently if it's using Delta Lake merge. Uh, absolutely. And I think they take care of all the complexity of uh, the ingest uh, uh, behind the scenes and uh, and uh, use the most efficient methods to uh, to do uh, uh, ingest and merge on Delta. Merge is one of the complex things to get right, uh, especially when you're doing CDC from, from databases. I noticed that this was a Postgres database. Uh, so you were doing uh, CDC from a Postgres database into Delta Lake. Uh, and then you're applying the DBT transformations after that. So you kind of have your core ETL plus your last mile ETL with DBT all wrapped in one nice little package. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And then, um, I mean, I, I think that's kind of where where the bulk of the work is really in that um, the data modeling, some of the feature engineering that's going to happen uh, via DBT. Uh, with SQL running against Delta tables. So that's just a big part, right, of, of a lot of the use cases that we see. It's really a lot of ETL, a lot of data prep. Um, and then that modeling is kind of um, readily available. You do it directly on those tables from Databricks, no need to kind of use a different tool. So 
that's why it kind of seamlessly went from uh, from different stage to different stage. But yep, it's all kind of packaged in this customer engagement example. You know, uh, I heard you talk about- I just about... wanted to add, add one more thing here, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, yeah, when you're ingesting data, especially with using Fivetran, uh, they also provide some uh, uh, pre-built uh, DBD uh, uh, modules that one could use. Uh, right again, some of these are vertical or use case focused uh, that will uh, help you, you know, create your end-to-end -end, uh, flow much faster. And so I think uh, they, uh, uh, as part of this demo, we didn't we did not use some of those, but uh, these are some things that uh, one could uh, potentially use. But this is what you're referring to, right, Prasad? Yeah, some exactly. Packages. Yeah, these are these are incredible. Uh, accelerators for sure. If you have really specific data models and data sources, so Marketo, uh, Snowplow is, is some that our customers use. Um, but yeah, you can see that I think Fivetran is probably the biggest, looks like the biggest contributor of all these different helper um, packages that DBT has. We've got a few requests out on the comments uh, for the notebook. Uh, usually, uh, I know I asked about the solutions accelerator, still working on it. Uh, would this be something that we can put up on the uh, Tech Talks GitHub, or do you want to wait till it becomes a full-blown accelerator? Uh, yeah, I think that's something that we can do now, unless uh, Samir, you, you have any uh, reservations for that. I do not. In case we want to yeah, clean it up. I think it's in a, in a good state, and we'd, we would just build on this in the future. Awesome. So for everyone's asking, we'll, we'll get the, the link out on uh, all. We'll make sure that Lee and Karen post the leak up to the meetup. Um, and share it, share it on social later once we, we've uh, made it available. Sounds good. Any this other questions been... we can answer? Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Lee. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say this has been great. Um, yeah, thank you guys for your time. And I'm sure there'll be questions flowing in as people watch the, the recording later. So we'll keep you posted. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks everybody for attending. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone.